We are most honored to have with us uh, Professor Seamus Cohn, who is an assistant uh, professor of sociology at Columbia University. And we are thrilled to have his book. As someone said to me just a little while ago, I said, how did you get this book? You know? And Seamus, we haven't taken you to the library, but it's a very small library. I just want to oh, okay, good. <laughs> it's a very small library, but um, we like to think of us as very erudite over there. <laughs> but the real reason goes to uh, Eric and Jeanette Schwartz. Uh, Eric and Jeanette is one of our volunteers at the library, and uh, also gives us lots of guidance on books, and she is our graphic novelist specialist. She is really terrific, among other things. But her husband, Eric Schwartz, who's in the back of the room, edited Seamus's book, and it is through our fine fellows uh, and fellow Hope Wellians that we have the honor of uh, having Dr. Khan with us. And if you will indulge me for just a moment, Dr. Khan is, uh, as I said, a professor of sociology at Columbia University. And he has written this wonderful book called Privilege. And it's an inside look at how kids are raised and in a very elite institution. And he himself went to St. Paul's. He went back 10 years later, which I'm sure he's going to tell us a lot about. And it's a fascinating book uh, as a look into not only what goes on inside these, these schools and institutions, but about the social mores, the social injustices, a lot of things that happen. And if you don't mind, I want to read, there's a, as I was looking through things on how to introduce him, I came across a terrific review that sums it up. I, I, I said to Seamus, I said, this guy gets your book 100%. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read just this one little paragraph uh, that I think just says it all. And I already asked for permission, so. <laughs> if you want to peek inside an elite New England prep school, here it is. But while nosiness about St. Paul's is a perfectly good reason to read the book, Khan's purpose is higher. This is a book about the promise of America and how well the nation is fulfilling it. It is a book that suggests how money still trumps the ideals and how a myth fostered at St. Paul's and other such schools serves a new elite class. Most usefully, the book explores why racial and ethnic diversity, a challenge that St. Paul's is meeting admirably, is not synonymous with mobility and equality. And that's from the Concord Monitor. And I think that just sort of sums it up. And I am very proud to introduce, on behalf of Hopewell Public Library, Professor Kahn. Thank you. I'm, start, I'm starting a timer because uh, I'm going to try and, I'll talk for probably 25, 30 minutes. I'll try and keep it pretty short. I'll read a little bit, but I'll just warn you that my vision is really, really bad, uh, so I don't read particularly well. Um, so that will be kind of a challenge for an author, but you know, I, I, computers, I can make things much larger. Another review began, some say it's better to have a writer in the family than an assassin, but, <laughs> but not much better. Um, <laughs> and this was actually the review in uh, the St. Paul's Alumni Magazine uh, <laughs> by a guy named Nelson Aldrich, who is the sort of a scion of the, the, the Rockefeller family. Um, from the class of 55, uh, his father had been the governor of New York. He was, you know, a long inheritor of uh, the Rock Rockefeller wealth. Um, he went on to say nice things about the book, uh, but I thought I'd temper the, the initial review. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book and a little bit about its motivations so the sets of things that I'm kind of interested in and how the book helps address those. Um, so what I'm sort of most interested in in the world is inequality, uh, the gaps between rich and poor people. Um, and almost always when we think about inequality, we think about poverty. That is, we think about the conditions of disadvantage, the ways in which people are uh, suffering, which their chances of moving ahead are uh, diminished or difficult. Um, and we do this for good reason. That is, if we can understand more about the conditions of poverty, maybe we can do something to alleviate uh, the suffering of the poor. But one of the things that sort of I found as a curiosity in graduate school, um, when I began to look at what people were saying about inequality, was that almost all of the increases in inequality over the last 40 years or so have been explained by 
wealthier people getting wealthier, um, and not really poor people getting poor. There's evidence that they're getting a little bit poorer, but by contrast, rich people are much, much, much richer. Um, and so the reason that the gap between rich and poor was increasing was not because the bottom was falling out of America. It was because the top was sort of moving way, way, way up, almost exponentially. So a little bit of statistics. Uh, if you look at sort of the average American since 1968, they haven't had much of a change in their life. Um, that is, the earnings that they have for a family haven't shifted very much. If you move up the income distribution, one of the things that you find is that people have gotten bigger and bigger raises since 68. So the bottom 10%, or the, I mean the top 10% of Americans are making about two-thirds, maybe 100% more than they used to make. The top 1% are making about 325 to 350% more. And then the top 0.1% are making about 500% more. The further up you go, the more and more they're making. And so I began to wonder, why don't we look more at these people? Right? If, if a lot of the action seems to be going on among the very wealthy, how is it that we don't know an enormous amount about them? Now, one of the answers is because uh, we don't have a lot of access to them. And for me, a kind of white bulb went on. And I was like, well, I have access to them because I went to a very elite boarding school. Um, I went to a place called St. Paul's School. Are most of you, are some of you familiar with St. Paul's? Okay, um, so St. Paul's was founded in the 1850s, 1856, I should know the exact date, even though I wrote a book about the place, but we're going to go with 1856. Um, and it was founded in sort of response to a series of other institutions that had emerged in the United States um, some a century earlier. Uh, so there are other famous boarding schools like Andover and Exeter. But it emerged with a different kind of purpose. Um, Andover and Exeter, I'll use as kind of the, the counterweight or the, the, to St. Paul's, they first began um, as places that weren't really boarding schools. Instead, students would go and they would reside with families in the local community and then go to school, um, much like they would in British schools. Through the 1820s and 30s, um, the graduating age of kids at Harvard was around uh, 18, um, sometimes as low as 16. So the idea of even having a high school um, where people would go to a high school and then they would go to college was a completely sort of foreign thing. Um, but through the 19th century, sort of the period of time where people were adolescents expanded a little bit, and colleges changed, and institutions like St. Paul's emerged. Now, St. Paul's purpose was not to prepare people for Harvard. Um, so of the first 70 people who graduated from St. Paul's, I think only about 10 or 12 of them went on to college. Um, the idea was not that these institutions would emerge as feeder schools to Ivy League institutions. The Ivy League as an institution really didn't even exist in our imagination at the time either. The idea behind the school was that it was going to provide a kind of gentlemanly education, in particular a Christian education, to a group of young men. Um, and it was founded by this guy who just wanted his sons to get an education, so he took his farmhouse in New Hampshire, he found a 24-year-old really young guy, uh, a reverend, and said, I need you to educate my sons and this other friend of theirs. And they got into a cart and they went up to Millville, this place called Millville, um, which is, if you go to St. Paul's, you can know St. Paul's as Millville, it's like an insider idea, because that was his farm's name. And they began to educate them there. Now, this guy, his name was Coit, and he uh, had a tremendous impact on the American educational system. In fact, by the time he died at St. Paul's, so he sort of died at the post, He'd gone from having three students to having about 300, um, and he had some 50 faculty members. And he transformed this institution into something um, that we might recognize today, which is a place where young men would go and experience a religious education through a degree of isolation, um, an expression of their a degree of their innocence, and also a development of uh, their physical bodies as well. So this was part of what we would think of as the muscular Christianity movement. Um, other parts of this movement would be like the YMCA. Uh, so uh, this, this movement was the idea that uh, Jesus had become too feminine, um, too much love, uh, too much compassion, and not enough of the strength of, of Christ was understood in religious expression, and, and so it would be transformed. And this is sort of the founding, the initial founding of St. Paul's. And it, Changed considerably by the 1960s. It had uh, women 
It hired its first black faculty member in the 1950s, which is quite early, if you, if you can imagine, for elite educational institution. But pretty soon, um, St. Paul's became a kind of feeder place to elite colleges. Um, and a way to see this would be to just look at the acceptance rates of a place like St. Paul's into Harvard or Yale or Princeton. I should have started with Princeton, <laughs> given where I am. I apologize. People always do Harvard, Yale, Princeton, right? They should do Princeton and the other schools, right? <laughs> um, Stanford never appears. So sad for Stanford. Um, the, the acceptance rates are well above what they would be from uh, most institutions. When I was there, the most common college uh, students went to was Harvard, um, followed by other Ivy Leagues. Uh, its acceptance rates to Harvard have dropped, particularly in the last four or five years. Um, it's getting harder and harder to get in. Um, but still, I don't know if it's the most common school that people go to, but it would be in the top three um, for sure. Um, and beyond that, it's an incredibly wealthy institution. So it has 500 students and a endowment of about $500 million at this point. It's been growing. So it's uh, one of the wealthier educational institutions per pupil. Um, the amount that they spend on their students is incredibly high. So whereas the average American high school spends about $8,000, $10,000 per pupil, St. Paul spends around $85,000, so about 10 times as much in terms of its investment per pupil. Um, and these kinds of advantages have been shown to be enjoyed throughout one's life. So as I began to think about my experience at St. Paul's, I was like, well, this is a place that's pretty associated with a kind of realm of the American elite. And if I go there, I might understand something about the shifting culture of the American elite. I might be able to make sense of how and why it is that elites have been able to make so much more money. Or even if I can't understand how it is that they've been able to see so much more of the national wealth, the share of the national wealth, I might be able to understand how they make sense of this process and how they manage to think their way through it. There's a second transformation, I think, that's really interesting since 1968 that we should think about when we also think about this massive increase in inequality. And that second transformation has to do with uh, uh, the transformation of institutions like St. Paul's, like Princeton, in terms of the compositions of their classes. So when we think about inequality, we almost always think about mechanisms of social closure. Um, that is, we think of inequality as emerging because there are resources. And so let's say my water is a resource. And one of the ways in which I create inequality, like let's say, well, water's not a scarce resource right now. Uh, so I, I might have, the, the cookies. <laughs> we can think of the cookies as a resource that might become scarce at some point, uh, particularly if I seize them, right? Um, and then we can't really have a market for cookies because no one has cookies but me, right? Um, and I can extort things from you perhaps more than I could otherwise because I create a kind of moat or a fence around the cookies. And I insist that in order for you to enjoy those cookies, you've got to come through me. You've got to figure out a way to like deal with me. And I can exploit that to my advantage. Right? So the way in which you know, inequitable relationships kind of exist is because we don't have an equal playing field. Not everybody has access. It's actually a very liberal idea, right? That if you open up everything to a kind of like an equal marketplace of some kind, you'll get more equality. Well, if we look at elite educational institutions, or even American life um, more generally, and we want to compare it today to 1968, if I stood before you and I said, you know, the problem with today compared to 1968 is that 1968 was a much more open society, and today we're far, 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 far more exclusive, and that's why inequality has increased, many of you would denounce me. And you probably denounce me for good reasons. You would raise your hand and say, like, you know, Seamus, I don't know if you've heard, there's this group of people, they're called women, that make up half the population, and they didn't have a lot of access to institutions in 1968. In fact, they were pretty systematically excluded from all kinds of places. And you might also say, Seamus, I don't know if you've heard about this process, it was called the Civil Rights Movement, it was a pretty big deal, um, still kind of is. There's a monument that was just unveiled as part of this thing. Um, and it created a huge transformation in the fabric of American life. If you look at my institution, Columbia University, and you think about these processes, you quickly see how successful they've been. Um, 
That is, the incoming class at Columbia is now 15% black, uh, more than the overall percentage of, of blacks in the population. Women far outperform men in high schools and in colleges. So if most colleges had equitable admissions criteria for getting into college, they would have probably 60, 40 classes. You see this at state schools. In fact, um, you know, the, the Times every year will have a thing like, look at North Carolina and the campus at North Carolina. There are no men, you know, and those that are there, like, you know, not enough of them are straight. Like, there's like this, <laughs> you know, because um, there's like anxiety about colleges, it's marriage markets and things. Um, and so, like, what's going to happen, right? There's this tremendous social anxiety. This, this is a sort of a triumph of the open of ac opening and the access of institutions to women. Um, we could tell a similar story for Asians, and actually today the biggest penalty for applying to college is an Asian penalty. That is, the chances of getting in are considerably lower if you're applying as an Asian. I, you know, I often joke that like the biggest affirmative action program right now in colleges is for men, right? Um, and as much as white people complain that like minorities are taking their spaces, Asians have a lot more to complain about in terms of if you if they were to to talk about the same basic kind of standard. But this story is a story of the opening of these kinds of elite institutions. Um, I wouldn't have told this to you much more prosaically if I just said, like, think about the Barack Obama effect. Um, the fact that somebody like that would be elected. So how is it then, if we begin to think of, of the opening of all of these kinds of institutions, um, particularly elite institutions, that is, institutions like St. Paul's, like Princeton, like Columbia, have celebrated this kind of transformation more so than other places. It, if you were to identify sort of a key place where this is happening, elite institutions would be the place you would point to as this being really the most successful transition. How is it the case that then those kinds of institutions are producing people who are creating greater and greater levels of inequality? What's going on in these institutions and how are these people making sense of their lives? That's how I went back to St. Paul's. These are sort of the rough puzzles that I had in my mind. And um, if you want to know the answers, just read the book. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, so I went back to St. Paul's and I spent a year there. Um, I spent a year as a teacher. Um, and, um, okay, 15 minutes, that's great. It was a great, because normally the setup is like, 90% of the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I went back as a teacher. So I went back as a teaching fellow. Um, uh, I went back without salary. So the way in which I got myself in were twofold. I said to them, uh, I'll work for free. Um, which at which point in time they were like, yes. Because uh, as wealthy as an institution this was, particularly the time that I went there, the guy who was running the place, um, was looking for mechanisms to, to have more money. Um, in my view, particularly for himself, uh, not necessarily for the institution. Um, and I said to them I would go and study the school, and I would study the school in the production of elites. And, you know, in, in, in my world, like in the world of sociology, elites is coded as like a bad word, right? It means like people sort of prickle when they hear elites, because when they hear elite, they think injustice. You have to keep in mind that in St. Paul's world, the word elite is not a bad word. It's not a word that's like something horrific. Instead, there's kind of this understanding that all societies have elites. And that there's going to be some institutions that have to produce them. And you either have good elites or bad elites. And if you have moral institutions producing your elites, you're better off than if you don't. I was trying to leave that thought before the uh, train came by. <laughs> I'm tired of pretty well, I'm pretty well. 
Um, so my commitment to going there meant that I um, would teach a class or two. I would run a series of internal studies for the school, um, which involved looking at data that they had on students going all the way back to 1968. Um, grades, where people were from, like so zip codes, so sociologists will give you a sense of their SAT scores, colleges applied to, colleges admitted to, etc. Um, that data turned out to be incredibly poor in terms of its the data entry quality. So basically, the school had hired the children and faculty members over the summer to enter the data, and they were not so religious in the, their, their entry, so I threw it all out, um, which I learned after five months of work. You might have learned it after two days of work, but it took me a much longer period of time to realize how bad it was. Um, I coached three sports, and uh, so club soccer, uh, uh, and then I coached the men's squash and the men's tennis teams. Um, I had played squash and tennis there. Um, and uh, then I also lived in an apartment on campus. All faculty live on campus. And I was an advising in a dorm. So there are some 20 odd dorms on campus, and each of them have about four faculty members associated with them. And the faculty members have to be in the house um, from about 7 to 11 uh, every night of the week. Not every faculty member, but we rotate through, obviously. So usually two nights a week, you're there in the dorm um, to make sure that kids are doing their homework and sort of getting ready to go to bed by around 11. And you also have to make sure that everybody's home by 10, 10, 30, right? Because you need to, these are, these are kids between the ages of 14 and 18. You want to make sure that they're, they're, like, they're, they're there, right? Um, uh, as, as most parents would, would be worried to make sure that their kids are there. Um, so these were my, my general tasks, and I worked in the academic dean's office um, uh, as I did this. And the courses I taught were in the, in the humanities division, I taught a course on moral philosophy, and I did some statistics. Uh, sort of a very baseline uh, for students. Um, and this was a pretty grueling schedule. It's a very grueling schedule for students. It's a great, very grueling schedule for faculty. Because on your average day, you wake up in the morning, at around 8 in the morning, uh, you go to chapel. Um, so the entire school meets. And by the entire school, I mean the students and the faculty. The staff are not part of the school. Right? They, they, they sort of serve it, but they're just not seen as... As, as part of the core of the institution, um, and it's in, sort of symbolically important that they're not in the chapel when the school meets every morning. And uh, the chapel is a time for announcements, a prayer. Um, the school's explicitly Episcopalian, but the prayer can be anything. Uh, so there would be Buddhist prayers, Muslim prayers. Um, uh, sometimes uh, there are prayers in Hebrew, but not very frequently, so not so many Jewish prayers. Often Christian, but uh, sometimes they're just pieces of advice, um, things that you should know or reflect upon. You stand up, you sing a hymn, someone performs for you. Uh, so when I was there, you know, uh, once Yo Yo Ma came and performed in the morning, uh, he played a block cello suite. Um, it was all very dull for everybody, they were just tired. Um, uh, and it's not always such high, high people, often students themselves or faculty will give a talk. A sort of five minute thing to sort of get you going in the morning. The idea is that teenagers are always tired in the morning. If you, if you get them in a room for, you know, half an hour where they have to stand and sit and talk and sing and pray and listen and things are going on, by the time you get them to class half an hour later, they'll be ready to go, right? Um, and then, they, you know, there'll be classes from about 8.30 to 2.30. Um, from about 3 to 5, you have sports. Six, a uh, couple nights a week, there'll be seated meals. There's a formal meal with the faculty and the students. And then, if you're on duty that night from 7 to 11, you'll be on duty. And then you do this six days a week. Um, so the, there's actually classes on Saturday. Uh, Sunday's the only day off. It's, it's a sort of a half day on Saturday and Wednesday. But if you're coaching a sport, that doesn't mean anything because the reason it's a half day is so that you can travel to, say, Deerfield in a bus that you're driving with your teenagers in the back to go play a sport and then get back in the bus when it's over at say seven at night and drive back. Um, it's an arduous day for faculty. It's even worse for students um, because uh, you know for faculty most of us generally kind of have our own lives independent of it or at least are very happy not to just go and sit alone in a room 
for a period of time after something like this. For students, they have to keep their lives active, right? The, they are also immersed in the anxiety of being teenagers. Um, but the busyness of the day is also meant to wear them down. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a kind of an, an explicit uh, sentiment that if you just keep them busy all day, they'll go to bed at night. Right, and then you know they they will be they'll be tired, and you know they won't get into trouble, and that's basically the sort of the plan. But there's also an imagination that these are truly exceptional kids, um, and that they can really be pushed incredibly hard. And as they're pushed incredibly hard, they're capable of responding and developing in truly fantastic ways. And that what the school is doing is it's trying to produce. Uh, a, a group of people who are going to lead us, right? Uh, a group of people who are capable of leading the nation. Um, and if you listen to the school talk about their alumni, this is actually a lot of what you'll hear about. The uh, people who are in quite significant positions, so the director of our FBI, our senator from Massachusetts, John Kerry, uh, they happened to live together when they were at St. Paul's. Um, and you know, this is the imagination. But that group that's leading, has also changed considerably. And that's a lot of what I spend time talking about in the book. Uh, the shift of these kinds of institutions as the civil rights movement, as the gender uh, movement, or the feminist movement gained steam from thinking of themselves as a set of institutions that reproduce a kind of patrician family-like elite to producing a new exceptional elite, uh, an elite that has a set of skills and capacities that really exceed other people. So I would articulate this in a kind of class language, and I, I, I'll return to this at the very end. Um, but in articulating it as a class language, what I mean is that elites used to think of themselves as a class, actually quite consciously, as a group of people who had a set of cultural tastes, attributes, dispositions, um, that justified their rule that also explain why it is that they were who they were, and why it is that they tended to reproduce themselves, right? They were, they were a kind of, there was a groupness to them. Um, the word, the very word accessibility of a kind of patrician elite uh, evokes this. Whereas the elites at St. Paul's are something different. So I'm going to read for a moment, come up with a quick set of answers, and then I'll, uh, to some of the things I've hinted at, and then I'll stop. 24 minutes. Good. I sat across from Chase Abbott. We were in my faculty office, a wood paneled room on the first floor of the schoolhouse, one of the main academic buildings on campus. At times, Chase, Chase seemed to claim my office as if it were his own. He stretched, sat back comfortably in his chair, almost lounging. When he first entered, he looked closely at the papers on our desk, just barely resisting the urge to go through them. Before he sat down, he inspected the books on my shelf even going so far as to take one down and flip through it casually before putting it back in a different place. As we talked, his comfort and confidence were abundant. I thought at moments that perhaps it was I who were visiting him. Yet despite uh, this self assuredness he was still a teenager. At other times, he would avoid eye contact, looking down at the floor or out the window to my right. He was a senior boy who felt very at home and very lost at St. Paul's. Chase had none of the angular equine features of many of his classmates. His face was soft, his skin pale, with a ruddy hue on his cheeks and nose. Late in the year, I would see him in a seersucker suit with a pink tie, boat shoes without socks, and a straw hat. I never saw him so supremely confident or comfortable than when in that outfit. In the upper, where many students live and all the students dine, the names of every graduate were engraved upon the wooden hallways. As Chase ate his meals three times a day, he passed the names of several generations of Abbott men who walked to St. Paul's. Much of his life had been spent among graduates of St. Paul's and other elite boarding schools. Attending St. Paul's had been an expectation for as long as he could remember. To him, at least, it seemed his birthright. Yet, at yet his time in the school had not been triumphant. He was not a strong student, and he was not very popular. His enduring connections with the school had not translated into unbridled success. It surprised me to find that Chase, a boy who seemed to grow up in the very bowels of boarding school society, would struggle emotionally, academically, and socially at the school. If anyone was to be absolutely at home at St. Paul's, it should have been Chase Abbott. After a particularly difficult first year, during which he didn't get along with his classmates and could not relate to his advisor or many of his teachers, Chase moved into Andrew's house, where the other students were, were more like him. 
They also tended to have long-term connections with the school. They were all fairly wealthy. They had summer homes on the same islands as various members of Chase's family. If you have to ask what islands, <laughs> uh, we're talking Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. If you live in New England, the islands refers to those places, not Block Island. Um, many he had known before ever enrolling at St. Paul's. Most of the others he knew of through family and friends. And it was here where Chase began to finally find a home at the school. When I asked Chase how he ended up at St. Paul's, he seemed to take offense at the question. He proceeded to tell me uh, of a long series of family members who went to the school. He carefully mapped the history of the institution onto the history of his family. He spoke of his father and grandfather, of uncles and great uncles, all of whom were students under different administrations. He referred to former rectors of the school with a kind of intimacy that suggested that perhaps it was he who was at the school during the fabled reign of Samuel Drury in the 1930s. At the end of his story, in his history lesson about the school and his family, Chase turned the question around and asked, how did you end up here? <laughs> he betrayed a hint of intentional surprise when I told him that I had attended the same school as his family had for generations, that my name was written uh, among those of his family. That name and my appearance instantly revealed to Chase that I was not like him, that I could not construct the kind of narrative he had just provided me. As I explained my much briefer story, the child of immigrant parents who had become wealthy enough to send their kid to the school, Chase casually broke eye contact with me, looked indifferently out my window, and replied with a nonverbal grunt. Hmm. <laughs> Had this interaction happened 15 years earlier, while I was still an anxious and awkward teenager, I suspect I would have felt a combination of shame and rage. But years later, as I was older and the school had changed, I couldn't help but chuckle. The interaction was reminiscent of a moment in Robert De Niro's film, The Good Shepherd, when an Italian immigrant and mobster, Joseph Palmi, asks a select skull and bones, bones member of the American government, Edward Wilson, what people like him have in life. Palmi's played by, um, uh, what's his name? Joe Pesci. Right. And, uh, and uh, uh, the skull and bones member is played by Matt Damon. <laughs> Let me ask you something, Palmi says. We Italians, we got our families, we got the church. The Irish, they have their homeland. The Jews have their tradition. Even the niggers, they got their music. What about you, Mr. Wilson? What do you have? The United States of America. The rest of you were just visiting. Chase's hmm was his try to Wilson as reply. He had St. Paul's. People like me were really visiting. In mapping his life on the, and his heritage onto the school and the life of the school, in claiming its history as his own, and in romanticizing the school's past, he attempted to take ownership of the place. My chuckling was not just because I was older and more secure. There was something quaint and old-fashioned about his manner. But what have seen the forceful utterance from much of the school's history now rang somewhat hollow. I'll try to keep going. The power behind Chase's question and his response to my answer was empty. I knew that his attempts to claim the school were not successful. He sat before me in part because of his struggles. Though confidence and self-righteousness bubbled up periodically, much of the time he was not at home, at a place that was practically his birthday. I'll jump ahead. What has happened to the American elite? How is it that the old socially dominant who believe in the importance of their family breeding have lost their hold on institutions like St. Paul's? How have the entitled become more like the black students of just 15 years ago, increasingly alone and isolated? Have they lost their power or are they simply just concentrated in one area, but with power still firmly in their grasp? And how have schools like St. Paul's continued to produce privileges for their students while rejecting the kind of entitlements that were for so long tightly coupled with such privileges? What do the huge cultural shifts at a place like St. Paul's mean for the future of Lily and for the rest of us? So, this is the set of questions I sort of set up, and let me give a very, very brief set of answers. I'll give my book. Right? Um, the answer that I'll give is twofold. Um, and the first part of it is uh, that while we have had tremendous shifts in the character of the demographic constitution of college classes, uh, particularly around race and gender, their class composition hasn't changed as profoundly. Um, in fact, most elite schools are richer than they were 20 years ago. Um, and I don't just mean that the people are richer, because if you, if you, understand, like if, if, if you thought about the story I told before, well, if rich people are richer, of course the schools are going to be richer. I mean the percentage of students who come from the wealthiest of the wealthy, or even who just come from the top 10% of American earners, has increased over the last 20 years. 
So while the composition of classes has shifted, the class composition has not. And this is an important point. The second thing I'll point to is the ways in which, as these push for diversity have increased at institutions like St. Paul's, individual level explanations of success become really viable at these institutions and become heavily mobilized, such that people don't think of themselves so much as a class or a group anymore. Instead, they think of themselves as successful individuals. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, think for a moment about um, this neighborhood. Lots of American neighborhoods. Most American neighborhoods are pretty racially segregated, uh, by which I mean that white people tend to live around other white people. If you're black or Latino, you tend to live around kind of other black and Latino people. You're not that likely to live around other white people. So it's mainly white people who are the most isolated. And wealthy people tend to be pretty isolated from non-wealthy people. In fact, they tend to be very non-isolated from non-wealthy people. Now, what does this experience produce? Well, you go to high school or you go to a middle school in a fairly wealthy neighborhood, a well-off neighborhood in America. And what do you see? A lot of people who look like you. And what's your experience there? Well, you have to work really, really hard to get into college. I'm not going to diminish this at all. Um, or you have to work really hard to get into St. Paul. St. Paul's has an acceptance rate of 14%, right? And if you go to a very wealthy uh, play, uh, middle school and you have a bunch of kids applying to St. Paul's, if everybody's wealthy, all the parents are devoting a tremendous amount of resources to their kids to try and ensure that they can get in. They're doing the same in high school to ensure that their kids can get into college. So all of these kids are working hard to beat out their local competition, right? um, to be part of that 15% that can make it into a place like St. Paul's, that can make it into a place like Harvard or Princeton. And when they get there, they're not surrounded by people who look like them or who look like their local high school. Instead, they're surrounded by a very, very different kind of environment. They're, they're surrounded by a kind of an intentional community of diversity. Now, I fully support this intentional community of diversity. But what it does is help create a kind of cultural narrative that the people who are there are there because they're the best of the best. And kids are not, they're not correct in this narrative. I'll simply assert that. But they're not foolish for believing it because their own experience demonstrates it. That is, their own experience was, I had to work really hard to get into a place like St. Paul's. I had to beat out everybody else in my Princeton Middle School. I don't know if Princeton has good schools. Does Princeton have to do that? Yeah. Or Hopewell. So like, I had to beat out all these people in Princeton and Hopewell to get there. I got in. And then at St. Paul's, it's not like it's easy, right? I had to beat out a bunch of other people at this even more concentrated place to get into Princeton or Columbia or Harvard. And then when I get to Harvard, I don't see Hopewell. What I see is a community of diversity, right? A community that seems very, very different than anywhere else I've lived before. And what this supports is a kind of accounting of, I've really made it. And I've made it in part because of my own success. But what this does is it obscures many of the systematic ways in which opportunities are fairly systematically inherited through this process itself. That is, the investment required to get you into St. Paul's, the ways in which your parents are staying up with you at night, they're hiring tutors, they're ensuring that you go to, you know, sports camps, they, they find ways to send you to summer camps, etc. Those are costly. And they're also not available to the general population. That is, not everybody is provided with that opportunity. Once you enter St. Paul's, your school is spending 10 to 1 what other public schools are spending in terms of investing in students. That investment is not distributed across the population. And then when you enter into a place like Columbia, Princeton, Harvard, the investment continues. My idea here is simply that when elites thought of themselves as a class, they didn't feel any obligation to explain their position relative to their own hard work. It was, it was, they certainly thought that they deserved what they had. But it was because of their belonging to a set of institutions and their connections to those institutions. It was people like Chase Abbott. But as that class character of the elite declined, elites increasingly began to explain themselves 
relevant to their own individual capacities. And I believe that this is actually quite a dangerous thing. And the reason I think of it as a dangerous thing is that when one thinks in a kind of class terms, you begin to think of other people as groups too as groups that are provided with opportunities or positions, and then insofar as we're provided with those opportunities or positions, you know, those groups may be very natural, we think this is like, you know, an aristocracy looks like this, um, but that people's positions are because of their groupness, not because of their, say, moral character, whether or not they deserve it. However, if you think of the world as populated by a group of individuals who work hard for what they've got, then the positions of those in, the, in, dis, in, in experiencing disadvantage is explained not by the fact that they grew up with a disadvantage, but that they didn't seize the world that was available to them. They didn't look up at around this, in this world that we're in and see all of these open opportunities, this lack of fences, these filled-in moats that have emerged out of the 1960s and begin to say to themselves, well, I can take advantage of this and move ahead. Let me give one last bit of evidence of this, and this will be a little technical, but I think it's, it's important to think about, which is how much mobility we have in the United States. Um, and here I'm going to uh, rely upon, uh, there's, a, there's an index that we look at which is called intergenerational elasticity. And what this looks at is it says, how much, if you control for everything else, of differences in your parents' income will be manifest in your children. So if my parents make $10,000 more than your parents, how much more will I make than you? And a value of one would mean, like, uh, I'll make $10,000 more than you. A value of two would mean, I'll make $20,000 more than you. A value of 0.5 would mean, I'll make $5,000 more than you. Um, for a long time, we thought that this value in the United States was pretty low. So there was a Nobel Prize winning economist, his name was Gary Becker, still alive and with us who said, this is around 0.2. So if my parents make 10,000 more than your parents, I'm going to make $2,000 more than you. Right? And that's inequality, but it's not terrible. I mean, it's, it certainly would be kind of expected, right? That I would kind of make a little bit more than you. But Becker had pretty bad data, I'll say. Um, and he didn't really look at, uh, I won't get too technical, he basically like, looked at everybody at the same age, right? So people who were 27. When I was 27, I made $13,000 a year. Right? Uh, because I was in graduate school. Um, and that was not a very good predictor of my future earnings, I hoped. Um, <laughs> one never knows, but... Um, if you take moving averages of people and you look at um, uh, what we call panel data, so data of following the same people over a course of the years, estimates push this up to like 0.4. One guy just generated an estimate of like 0.62, uh, an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank. His name is Bush Parma Zumbin. To put that in perspective, what that means is that for a family in the top 10% to make the same, have ch their children or descendants make the same as a family in the 50th percentile, you're going to have to wait around five to six generations. It's a really long time, right, to have inherited levels of inequality in the United States. Further, there's a considerable amount of evidence in the U.S. or in the U.S. and actually more broadly that. In general, not always, but in general, when inequality increases, mobility declines. And so the increases in inequality that we've seen over the last 40 years makes us in part worry that this situation is going to get worse, not better. And these are the kinds of things that make me anxious. These are the kinds of things that make me think we need to do more to study uh, this, this group, this elite. Um, it's what keeps me up at night, and it's what pays my job, right? It's what I did for a living. Um, I'll stop there, and you guys can ask me any question you want. So, thanks. Everybody moves up, 
right? Because we always code mobility as a good thing, like people are moving up. If you have a perfectly mobile society, your starting position really shouldn't be predictive of your end position. So in other words, people should fall, right? And this is actually what produces a lot of anxiety. And this is something that you can't really sell to anybody. Um, and, and it, but it's actually one of these perverse things about like producing a perfectly mobile society. Like, if people are going to move, half the people are going to have to move down, right? Like, you know, well, not actually, well, yeah. Like, a lot of people are going to have to move down as well. Um, and parents aren't foolish to fight this, right? I mean, it, the, the idea that your own children would be worse off than you is something that, like, almost nobody would be willing to accept. Uh, so, that people are investing in their children in these ways doesn't make them bad people, right? Uh, it makes them sort of, in many ways, like natural people, I would guess. Like, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm not so much for like biological explanations, but I think like, in general, you want your children to be well off. Most people do. Um, but to think about mobility also means to think about, you know, the conditions under which people not just rise, but fall. Um, in which they lose their positions. Um, in which they don't inherit what their parents have. Um, and that, if it's going to be part of the conversation, is actually the, like a more difficult part of the conversation, which I never introduce because it's really hard for me to think through how you sell mobility as not just an upward thing, right? Politicians talk about mobility; they're always talking about up, 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 up. Sometimes things go down. Yeah. So, have you looked at whether or not um, there is that downward mobility? Because, in my observation, I think there is. Yeah. I mean, I think there are people who would have, maybe not the people who went to St. Paul, yeah. but people who were the elite of, say, a smaller city like Louisville or yeah. Nashville or something, who over the generations are getting sort of relatively less well off than they used to be. Sure. They, You're absolutely right. One way to think about this is that there's, there's one group in the world, in the United States, over the last 20, 30 years that's experienced a tremendous amount of mobility. And that's wealthy people. And I don't just mean that they're all getting richer. Some of them aren't getting richer, right? And their reference category is moving further and further and further and further away from you. You talk to people who are retired, they experience this all the time. Even if they're a retired banker, they look at what bankers today make and they think, God, I'm being surpassed. My father was a, a surgeon um, and a fairly successful one. And it's very interesting to talk to him about this because when he started his career, he was sort of imagining himself at the top of the income distribution, right? He made a lot of money. But in today's, by today's standards, he makes absolutely nothing, right? So his relative experience of mobility has been an experience of an incredible degree of downward mobility. There's a second way to answer this, which is that the very, very richest of the rich today are more likely to have made their own money than the very richest of the rich, uh, say, 40 years ago. Um, so this would be, you know, you can think of this as the Mark Zuckerberg effect, like Mark Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook guy, or all kinds of people like that who made a lot of money. Now, the first thing I would point out is that you know many of those people experience comparative positions of advantage. So Zuckerberg went to Phillips Exeter. Um, Bill Gates was from a wealthy family in Seattle. Like these people were not, you know, given where they are today, it's like a relative rags to riches, but. Still, that experience of the very, very, very rich having made their own money, certainly true. Um, so you, you can't just tell the kind of story that I'm telling um, by thinking of this as, oh, the Rockefellers and their brethren are now a lot richer. They're actually poorer relative to other categories. I, yeah. I think, other than the two you just named, if, I can th if I'm thinking of billionaires and people who made their own billions. Like Schwartzman. I can't think of a single one who went to prep school. Yeah. You, you, you named two, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the two well, I study prep schools; they're always on my mind, right? <laughs> Google, Amazon, mm -hmm. all the guys in um, private equity. Huh? Yeah. John Paulson. Yeah. Paulson didn't go to prep school. No, John Paulson. Yeah. yeah. Schwartzman, Stephen A. Schwartzman didn't go. Um, no, I mean, so I would say that you know those group of people who have made a tremendous amount of money have made their own money, but they're also not, they're not incredibly representative of the elite, right? Um, they're actually they're very... academic elites, I think. You know, the guys from Google and the guys from Amazon, these are, these are guys who did great, great schools. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, uh, but I, I meant like, 
they're not very representative of the overall population of, of, of people who say have a net worth of above $10 million. Um, but certainly, yeah. Yeah? Now, are you saying that individuals who are working hard and making their own wealth is not good for society overall in terms of functioning? Um, so, this is actually, uh, this forecasts like the, the project that I'm working on right now. Um, uh, so, the project I'm working on right now is on the history of the New York elite from the 1630s to today. Um, and telling the story of inequality in New York from the position of the elite, not the position of the poor. Um, that's what I'm writing on right now. And one of the things that I'm sort of running up against all the time is the idea that actually there are times where social openness, the capacity of uh, social boundaries to be more porous, can create the conditions of increased overall inequality, which then undermine what I would identify as democratic institutions. Um, uh, democratic institutions like fairness, equality, things like that. And that in many ways there is a kind of tension between equality and openness um, that we don't always think about so much. Now, do I think that uh, it's bad that individuals who work hard to get ahead, um, uh, uh, do I think it's bad for society that individuals who work hard to get ahead? No, but what I think is bad is that when so much of one's position, um, and I, let me take one step back. I think of this in aggregate terms. So I think of this not in terms of Johnny, a particular person who's navigating their way through the world, I think of it in terms of patterns, groups of Johnnies, lots of people like Johnny who are and, and a distribution of opportunity to people like them. What happens? What's their life chances given the kind of investment they've enjoyed? And what I worry about is that for the group of Johnnies that are fairly well off, that have things have incredible investments by their parents, they tend to end up in well-off positions. This is what you would expect. It would be very surprising if this weren't the case. Um, and I think it's also something that's fairly difficult, particularly in the American context, to constrain. What I find problematic about that is that when the group of Johnnies think of themselves, not as the group of Johnnies who've had lots of investments in their lives, but instead who think of themselves as individual engines of their own achievement, as explanatory of their own position, because then when those Johnnies look at the Freds back there, who are all the way back there, they think, well, it's not because that we're Johnnies and they're Freds. It's because I, Johnny, worked hard and he, Fred, didn't. And I think you see this in the political landscape of the United States right now, in terms of the ways in which people make sense of or deploy a set of what I think of as like cultural categories of poverty, the immorality of poor people, and the ways in which you know, those group of people don't value hard work, they're not willing to work, they're not doing what's required, I'm a, versus not investing anything in them, right? Um, we're eviscerating social institutions that might aid them. Versus I worked really hard to get where I am. And I think that this is a kind of, this is a delicate balance that requires um, a little bit more serious kind of like, uh, 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 thinking on our part. If you were to ask me what I prefer, like, a more aristocratic chase at it like elite? I'm not sure I'd have a good answer for that. Like, do I like those people better? I hated them when I was in school, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, so your discussion made me think of Tony Marks, the recent yep. president of Amherst, whose like, major initiative was to increase the class diversity mm -hmm. of Amherst with the idea that institu elite institutions like St. Paul's and elite colleges have done a lot to promote diversity by race and gender yep. and these other dimensions, but that class diversity has really been lacking and that institutions of this kind owe it to society to make much more conscious efforts to recruit people mm -hmm. from poor and working class families and make the kinds of investments that you're talking about to promote that sort of yeah. more meritocratic social mm -hmm. mobility. So I'm wondering how much of a consciousness the administrators at St. Paul have of that sort of mission and, you know, I mean, how, how that's thought about in this context. Yeah. I mean, I'll say that the people at St. Paul's had a deep commitment to equality, opportunity. That one of the challenges that's facing elite schools is that they're in deep competition with one another. So that the, the investment battle, how much they have to invest in the education of their kids, is one that's gone, it's like a, you know, it's like a, a, a tremendous arms race of investment. 
And the deep-seated commitment to diversity, I think, is a deep-seated is, is an important commitment. They don't have enough money to meet both their diversity goals and their class goals, class composition goals. Um, and this has a lot to do with the overall distribution of wealth in American society by race. Expert on this, so it's like a little weird to, to, to talk about uh, this to you, but to everyone else, so I'm like, she's not in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, if you think of the overall distribution of incomes by race, it's incredibly stratified. So, uh, household income by race, you know, average each American uh, household is around 60,000 a year, white households, it's around 50, 52. Uh, lat lat Latino households, it's like in the high 30s. Um, black households, it's around 30, 35, right? So very, very low, much, much less. You know, black, black households, about 60% less than white households in the United States. If you're going to aggressively recruit from within that population, you're also going to have to commit almost all of your financial aid money to that population. So, so it's kind of a numbers game that they can't win. And it's, it, it is to a degree that the racial commitment has, has you know, has superseded the class commitment. And if it hadn't, I would probably be here talking about a book where I denounce the racial composition of classes, of, of, of elite schools. So, you know, it's not as if they made a terrible choice, it's that they were forced into this kind of choice, and, and, and this has been part of the consequence. I think I'm getting cut off. And with that, <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave the <laughs>